I've been wide awake since 4 a.m. Needing to record this, not at all wanting to. It's now, I think it's about 6.30 a.m. And goodness, it's not often that something like this rips me from a deep sleep and won't let me go and insists that I take action, get up, do the thing I don't want to do. And let me tell you, I really didn't want to do this this morning. I don't want to do this now, record this. I feel like once again, I am a neophyte at the, the feet of a giant mountain to climb. But then here we are. Here we go. Uh, this quote from Carl Jung has been just reverberating through my brain. And I first heard uh, Richard Rohr, who I believe is a Franciscan monk, talk about this. But what Carl Jung said is, the aims of the second half of life are different than those of the first. The aims of the second half of life are different than those of the first. The reason that I have awoken so early today and that I'm recording this uh, kind of unusual episode is um, I just turned 50. Uh, not yesterday, not today, not about four or five months ago now, back in May 2024 to be exact. And not that that number in and of itself is all that important, right? We know numbers or ages are just numbers. They don't necessarily mean anything. And at the same time, they, they are symbols. Numbers, words, letters are symbols. They're symbolic of something. And I think for the last many years, uh, I've been entering into the second half of life. And there's not much in our culture, my culture, that prepares us to live the second half of life well. Uh, Richard Rohr points out that we are a first half of life worshiping culture. And Carl Jung reminds us that the, the aims, again, of the second half of life are different than those of the first. So if you're listening to this or, or watching this, um, you may be, gosh, anywhere on that journey. You may be still young, early in the first half of life journey. You may be well on your way through your second uh, half of life journey. You, uh, you know, people that have been following my work are tend to range anywhere from their mid twenties to your sixties and seventies even. And so, you know, I've, I've, I have been, I've been going through a lot the last few years. This entry into the second half of life for me has been uh, particularly challenging and, and difficult. Um, and so I think that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really left to, to question at this point if the aims of the first half of life are indeed different from those of the second. Um, what are the aims then of the second half of life? You know, I think about the first half of my life and it was, uh, it was characterized by, um, in many ways, trying to just get on my feet in the world and, and find my place and figure out, you know, where, where am I supposed to stand? Where, what role am I supposed to play in all of this? And, uh, boy, um, what an adventure it has indeed been. It's, uh, you know, I just give you a little bit of background into me. Uh, I'm uh, East Coast born in the United States, just outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, grew up um, in the suburbs of D.C. Uh, I've got three sisters and, and two moms, and my, my mothers were, were married not to each other, but to my father and my stepfather. Uh, my dad uh, left when I was four years old. Um, uh, something that I, I didn't 
really understand how deeply that would uh, affect me until much, much, much later in life. Um, I actually don't have a relationship with my father today, even though he is still alive. But uh, you know, I'll circle back to that later, or maybe another time. Um, <clears throat> but I was largely raised by my mom, as as a lot of uh, young boys uh, have been in our world, uh, by a by a single, independent, uh, professional, amazing mother who really held the world down. And um, and my stepfather came along when I was about ten years old, and. Uh, good man and um we he and i have a great relationship today but our our, our time uh, when he came into our home there were challenges it was um there were there were difficulties and uh again uh, forces that would shape who i became uh, as a man later and and particularly how i did intimate relationship with uh, with women um but then i just moving on, I, I went to college. I went to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, got a um, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, went into the Air Force from there, Was a uh, uh, spent about, about five years active duty, Re um, didn't retire but separated honorably, of course, as a captain. And I was completely miserable. I couldn't feel a damn thing. Um totally disconnected from my body, disconnected uh, from my heart, uh, disconnected from my feelings. Um, I was probably functionally depressed for uh, many, many years. And I, I, I got out of the military at 26 years old and just grabbed a backpack and went traveling around the world because I, I, I didn't know what else to do with myself. I knew that if I had just accepted a job at one of the defense contractors, which which was available to me, it was just like dead man walking. And so I went walkabout instead. And this was back in uh, 2000. So, I mean, all there was was email, basically, and maybe AOL, <laughs> you know, dial up internet, uh, internet cafes. There was no social media. There was no YouTube. Uh, there were no online courses, none of that. And so, uh, you know, I went walk about in the world to, to find myself. And boy, that that led to all kinds of adventures. I was married to a French woman in, in France uh, who, who I met on my travels. And, and uh, we actually, we married five weeks after we met. Um, uh, foolish and glorious all at the same time and and that was a what i what i call a spectacular catastrophe or ca uh, catastrophe spectaculaire um, but these are the adventures of the, of the first half of life right like throwing yourself into the world and and um I, at least i think it's what they should be for a lot of us a lot of us spend the first half of life uh, trying to gain security comfort uh job uh, status and and title, etc. And and I sure I, I did some of that, but ultimately that was I, I found out young in my in, again in my twenties in the military I had everything I had status I had uh, prestige I had respect I was a captain in the world's most powerful air force, and I was miserable, and I learned that young and I'm grateful for it even though uh, it was an incredibly painful painful time. Um, uh, you know, Carl Jung, coming back to Carl Jung in the first half and the second half of life, the first half of life, the, the aim of the first half is to develop a healthy ego, to figure out, again, how do I function in this world? What is my place in this world in the, in the context of culture and the need for economic security and stability and all of that? And um, <clears throat> so... You know, once I recovered from the the turmoil of getting out of the military, and I uh, ended up going and, and um, a couple years later, I the French woman uh, kicked me out of our Bordeaux centre-ville apartment, uh, gave me two hours to leave one day after I'd gotten into an argument with her mother, in which I I told her in French, uh, "Tu me fais chier," which means "You make me shit." Yeah, not, not cool, but um, there you were. 
<laughs> I was not in a good place in my mid twenties. So I came back to the United States very reluctantly, uh, but had nowhere else to go. And, um, this was after traveling to living in Egypt and traveling to Australia and to the outback and <clears throat> again, marrying the French woman, just having all kinds of adventures. I lived with a guru in India for about two months, month and a half. Um, again, another story for another time. That was a crazy experience. But then I came back and, and I partnered up with my dad to, to build a business. Um, and we created a $50 million business from scratch, $50 million business. Uh, it was a, a product that uh, my dad and his wife, my stepmom had been um, working with for many, many years and kind of the alternative medicine, energy medicine sphere. Um, you know, is it science or pseudoscience? Well, debatable, maybe, maybe not, but it became very, very successful. It became one of Oprah's favorite things in 2003 and 2005. Uh, I was actually on Oprah's show called, uh, I think it was called After the Show. Uh, I was there for a taping because Oprah loved this product. I, I don't want to name it because uh, a few years later, that uh, company was stolen by my parents, my dad and stepmom's business partners, which that kicked me out of that uh, whole soap opera and saga. And, and I went to manage a music band. Again, I'm in my, what am I, late, I'm in my mid-30s by this time, yeah. And uh, I went to manage a, a, a spiritual music band and uh, toured all over the country with these amazing, amazing men. This was the first time that I had really found men who felt like brothers, men who, who, who cared more or cared about more than just... Uh, the things that men typically care about, which is like, you know, women, war or sports, uh, the weather, work, I call them the five, the five W's. I can't remember all five of them, but women, work, uh, war, weather, and what's the last one? Uh, I don't remember, but um, I traveled all over the country with these men. Again, like finding myself, figuring out who am I? And through that work, ultimately, long story short, I, uh, I was probably more artist uh, than I was good band manager, although I took these men all over the country. We did like, oh gosh, how many? I mean, we did probably 200 concerts in like 80 cities all over the United States and Canada in from like 2000 and gosh, what was that, 2006 maybe to 2012. Incredible, incredible time. Um, again, all first half of life pursuits, you know, trying to create economic stability to, to uh, to create my breakthrough in life, right? And um, it was glorious and, and fraught and challenging all the things, right? That, that for anyone in, in our first half of life, we're going to experience and go through. And that led to uh, blogging and writing as I was writing as a band manager um, uh, to the, the kind of the fans of, of the band. And, and when the band broke up, I kept writing. And I started writing about, this was back in 2012, 13, 14. And I started writing about all that I was waking up to as a man uh, all the mistakes that I had made in intimate relationships and all the things that I was learning about those mistakes and, 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 you know, I was kind of, kind of uncovering this, the secrets to intimacy that should never be secrets. Like, why didn't anybody ever tell me these things when I was 20, 25? Why do I have to learn this in my late thirties after I have laid wreckage to so many hearts, including my own, uh, just out of pure ignorance, not out of, not ever out of any malicious intent. And so um, <clears throat> that turned into a, a, a very successful coaching career, ultimately, uh, as I was writing about all of these things and, and turning my, my artist management world into consulting, which led to coaching. 
uh, life coaching, personal coaching, and then couples coaching. I've been coaching couples for the last 10 years since probably about 2014, 15. And, um, you know, my first half of life has, 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 has landed me in this place. I, I finally, I met my, the woman who is now my wife, Sylvie, uh, back in 2015 as well, uh, when I was 41. And, um, well, actually today, whoa, it's our ninth anniversary, our nine year anniversary. How about that? She's still sleeping. Um, yeah, how about that? So that first, that was the first half of my life, right? Developing a healthy ego, answering the question, who am I, particularly in relationship to the culture, in relationship to, I, am, I a, am I a coach? Am I a manager? Am I a, a business owner? Am I an entrepreneur? Am I a husband? Am I a, what am I? What am I to the world? Right? What is my gift to the world? And in many ways, I answered that question. I answered that question. And the last few years as I've been initiated, you could say, into the second half of life, boy, what a, what a painful transition it's been, you know, my, my, my wife and I, we actually were going to get married in Ireland in April of 2020. April of 2020. Do you remember what happened in March? In April, we were going to have both of our families come together. They'd never met after, I guess that was like six years of being together, five or six years. They'd never met. We had this beautiful wedding planned, small wedding, but beautiful in Ireland, one of our our favorite spiritual places or the place that we have a spiritual connection to and um march 2020 pandemic shut everything down and that was the beginning of a of a series of painful events for my wife and i um uh sylvie that uh we're still you know here we are uh fall of 2024 still in the grieving but coming out of it I think I believe yeah so my uh, my therapist John Lee uh, uh, amazing man he, he was probably most well known for writing a book called The Flying Boy I think back in the 70s or 80s uh, he's now become my mentor and he shared with me um the other day in a conversation he said you know anyone over the age of 40 is going to be grieving for the rest of their life and I thought about that you know uh, uh, I think an important task of the second half of life especially for men and by the way <clears throat> before I say that let's talk about uh, what Carl Jung suggests is the task of the second half of life or the aim of the second half of life and that is essentially to discover your deeper self like who you truly are beyond what culture tells you you are not that not that you know if we've been doing developmentally healthy and balanced work we're also learning who we are beyond what culture what family tells us we are in the first half of life but i find it interesting that Carl Jung uh, calls out that the second half of life is just exactly that task. Like, like, and again, I, you know, I'm 50. It's I just turned 50, and it's symbolic, but it doesn't mean that now I'm in the second half. I mean, some people don't enter the second half of their life until their 60s or maybe 70s, and some people maybe never really set themselves to the work, the task of the second half of life. Um, Nothing wrong with it. No judgment. Again, our culture rewards, worships, first half of life ambition. Uh, it reminds me of a quote David White, the poet David White said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, that the uh, ambition is for the young because ambition can get you to the horizon, but it can't get you past it. It can't get you past it. You know, I've thought about that a lot. Like I've climbed many mountains in my life and, and, and getting to be a successful coach and author and making good money and being I'm finally married. I've got the I've got the dog I always wanted. She's right there. I've got the amazing woman that I always dreamed of. She's just right over there. 
and um, the, the, the work that I love. And so now what? Now what? what what's over the horizon? And, uh, you know, ambition won't get me there. Even doing this video is so edgy. Doing this episode. You know, if you're listening to this on my podcast, you're just hearing my voice. Uh, if you're watching this on, on YouTube or somewhere else, you're, you're seeing my face. And this is so edgy because, you know, I've been, I've been looked to for many, many years as an expert, as a, as a, as a man that, you know, doesn't hold myself like I've, like I'm perfect or I've mastered anything, but I've developed insight, uh, which I've shared back with the world. I, I wrote a book called Choose Her Every Day or Leave Her uh, that was born of, a, of an article that has been read by, by 30, 40 million people uh, since I wrote it. And, and you know, my work's been seen by t hundreds of millions of people around the world. Um, and so doing this recording this which again life just ripped me out of bed and said you know if, there, if there's one lesson I've taken and I've probably taken lots I'm taking lots of lessons but there's one lesson that I've learned from the first half of life it is it is it is take action even if it's messy even if you don't know what you're doing when, when I when when that band asked me to manage them I think I was 30 early 30s uh, I was working at my parents my dad's company making really good money and um, but I knew it was time for me to leave. They, 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 their their business partners would steal the company from them like six months after I left, uh, like overnight. Again, another crazy story for another time. But I um, I uh, the band came to me and just said, uh, Brian, we want you to manage us. And I remember just thinking about it for half a second and said, Okay, I'm in. Let's go. I went from making ten thousand dollars a month to twenty five dollars a month overnight and that $25 didn't go up a whole lot over the next couple of years but that was the first half of life and so you know even as I'm in my second half of life now uh, you know that lesson stays with me oh and there's so many more lessons but as I was sharing grief has been a, a notable and profound part of this entry into the second half of life as I reflect on all of the, the friendships that I've lost over the years just because I've been so nomadic and I've traveled so much. And I mean, all the, the beautiful people that I've gotten to know over the years that I don't get to see and some I will never see again. Um, you know, I think of losing my father who's still alive. That happened actually a year ago, although the truth is I lost my dad as a father probably 25 years ago it's only now in the last year since i've in the last few years as i've attempted to really re reconcile with him and discovered finally that that's not going to happen um that i'm really grieving uh that experience you know and it's funny as i'm <clears throat> getting to this age i'm you know a lot of old men are bitter you know the the grumpy bitter old man phenomenon <laughs> Well, Francis Weller, who wrote The Wild Edge of Sorrow, says, grief unmetabolized turns bitter. Grief unmetabolized turns bitter. So, grief work, I believe, is essential as we start to come into the second half of life. And again, you may be coming into the second half of life in your late 30s or 40s. Or you may be there in your 60s or 70s. Again, whether you're a man or a woman and... Um, you know, the last number of years I've been really focusing on working with men. Um, but I still do work with uh, women as well, uh, both individually and in my couples uh, coaching practice. But I've just been reflecting so much on where do I go with my life from here in the second half. I've gotten everything I thought I ever wanted. And a big part of me has been left with, so what? Now what? Um, as I said, this transition has been marked by a lot of, a lot of painful loss. Uh, my wife and I, uh, last year discovered that we could not have a child together and uh, I cried for three days. It just absolutely devastated me. And that was a little over a year ago and now we're just sitting in the question. We're not fully there yet, but you know, do we adopt, um, 
we're working through that. We don't know yet. Um, still reconciling with that reality of being unable to have a child. Uh, so, um, and we've made three cross country moves also in the last couple of years. Again, it's just, it's just, and there's 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 just so much more complexity again losing my father and other things but you know here we are and um so this is what i want to invite you my dear listener or 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 viewer of this to join me in this exploration of the second half of life the ambitions and aims of the second half of life what are we what are we up to uh if you're anything like me, if, you're, if this is resonating with you, then you know the things that you used to be ambitious for, they don't work anymore. You know, whether it's making more money or having a, a better job or, a, or a, 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 I don't know, a higher stas, status title or a better this or a better that. There's something, nothing wrong with any of it, but yet it's not going to scratch that itch and you finally figured that out. So again, if you're listening to this on my podcast, you'll know that that I'm doing other episodes with my longtime uh, bestie, Tate. Uh, we're interviewing guests and having really interesting conversations. Um, I'm going to intersperse <clears throat> I'm going to excuse me, I'm going to intersperse the podcast with with snippets like this, you know, that are maybe 15 to 30 minutes long. Uh, same if you watch this on the YouTube channel, you'll know that I uh, post lots of different kinds of videos all tend to be centered around intimate relationships how to do intimate relationships well and um, uh, and also men's work uh, so subscribe please consider subscribing to this channel and uh, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already hmm. join me on this journey we're just getting started uh, regardless of where you are uh, welcome to the second half of life. I look forward to uh, this adventure with you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching.